Okay, we're going to start. This will be the, the second of three uh, topics. And the question here is, is this the start of the tribulation? Uh, now, we're going to go till 12 o'clock. Uh, it'll be somewhere. Ow. <laughs> it'll be similar to what we did before. Uh, so we'll heal our presentation, then the question and answers, but there will be uh, pizza coming for noon, and so we're going to still eat downstairs, but we'll get it, it'll be brought in from outside. But it's uh, wood-fired pizza, some pretty cool stuff from the local uh, town. So we'll do, uh, again, we, we want to get started so we can get wrapped up. So, Christian, okay. I'm half deaf now. <laughs> <laughs> if it was bad for you, it was worse for me because I was right next to it. Um, so this is this was a, a game changer. So if you've um, been to the Temple Mount, has anybody been to the Temple Mount? So we got some some people. So this this is in the very far north end of the Temple Mount, and it's a fountain. It was built by Sultan Suleiman. The Magnificent, and it has this little stone decree written in Old Arabic. And uh, anybody can go walk and take a picture of it. It's just sitting there on display. Um, but when I was doing the, uh, the temple research, I think that that became something that was really significant to look at. So we'll look at this prophecy and start talking about why. <clears throat> so a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Daniel's prophecy of 77s. Um, but there are some things that I, I think um, have, have been missed until, until now, and I'm sure providentially, um, to be revealed at the, at the proper time. At the end of Daniel, it says, But go your way, Daniel, um, for these things are sealed until the time of the end. And so we should expect that there would be new things that would come up as we're, we're going. Um, I have no good answer for why I would be up here telling you about these things. Um, and not somebody else. There, there are things that are plain to see. Anybody could have, have found these. Um, why an engineer from South Dakota? Um, I, I don't, you know. But, but seeing them and knowing that they weren't known, I felt compelled and felt led that I should, should start talking about this. But <clears throat> 77s are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And, and it starts with 70 sevens. A seven um, in Hebrew can mean several different things. It can mean the number seven, it can mean a week, and it can mean a seven of years or a week of years. Um, and it depends on the context. In this context, um, we should understand that it's seven years. In fact, there's another place in Daniel where he says, uh, a, you know, three sevens of days um, to distinguish it from the 77s that he's talking about, 77s of years. So it's 490 years. Um, and this is commonly seen as being broken up into a, a separate piece. And I'm going to suggest that, you no, know, 490 years means 490 years. But there's another answer to the riddle. Um, but let's keep looking at the, at the verse. Um, so you are to know and to discern from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Really, Messiah Prince, um, the is added in English as, um, you know, assuming that there's a connection between those titles. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. And <clears throat> one of the things when you assume that scripture is you know, written by God, every word is, you know, not one jot or tittle will, will pass from the law until all these things take place. It's one of the things that Jesus said. You look and you go, every word here is telling us something um, and, and trying to, to, you know, as we try to analyze that. Um, but there's this decree to restore and build Jerusalem. And we know that this was issued 
in the past, um, in fact, there were four possible decrees. Um, King Cyrus made one, King Darius made one, and Artaxerxes made two related to the restoration of Jerusalem. And so that creates a little bit of a puzzle or a mystery. Right? Which one of those is the right one? And so those have been debated. And in the early church, they literally debated like almost all of them. So from, say, 180 to 200 um, AD until today, there's still debate. People will hold different positions on which decree they think was the right one. And I'll, I'll share with you what I think it is. Um, and why, but just to be you know open, there's lots of people that have looked at these and tried to, but because there's differences of, of ideas and thoughts, the base thing is always true. There's a decree, and from that time there's a count, and we're trying to puzzle through the enigma that God's given us, the mystery that he's given us to solve. Um, and there will be some division of seven weeks and 62 weeks. Why not just, that's 69 together, that's 483 years, but why 7 and 62? So those are also kind of, hmm, I don't know, but I, I know the math of the sum, um, but there's you know some interest in why is it separated, and then a plaza and a moat. Why does he mention the plaza and the moat? Okay, but those are just things to think about. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war, and desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until the complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Some of this is also, you know, trouble in the language of, um, as we translate things, when you don't perfectly understand what, what's being said, and it's being said in a different language, you write things, and so sometimes in prophecy they come out a little fuzzy in English, because they're trying to be true to the original text, um, and whenever you translate something from one language to another, you have two choices. Literally, you know, you can say, you know, um, to kill the lights, you could say, you know, matar la luz, which would be to kill the lights, literally. It's a word for word, but that's not what it means. Apagalus is how you, which means to turn off the lights, is how you would translate that. But you, you have to decide which one you're going to do. Are you going to literally translate what it says, or are you going to translate what it means? But you can't translate what it means if you don't perfectly understand what it means, especially in prophecy, that's a challenge. So oftentimes it's just you write what it said, and it's for us to puzzle over those and even look at the original words in Greek or Hebrew and, and try to make better sense of that by, by studying. Um, and so in each one of these, when you have a, a, some kind of thought over what that specific word might mean, then that's a good place to dig in and look at the underlying grammar. But there's an overall context that helps us understand what it's talking about. And this first part, after 62 weeks, which is presumed to be after the 7 and 62, the Messiah will be cut off. And so that pointed to the crucifixion of Christ. And it, and it really points to the whole ministry of Christ. In fact, um, in the book you'll see there's this Hebrew word has four possible meanings. And a lot of times the translators would try to discern which of those four um, is possible meanings of the Hebrew word is the right one. As I was going through it, um, I'm pretty sure I make the case in the book that all four meanings of the word cut off were fulfilled in Christ's life and ministry and death on, on the cross. So you go, whoa, wait a minute. He used a word that has four separate meanings and he meant all four of them at the same time. Yep, I think so. That's kind of a neat idea because we tend to be really like, no, it has to mean one thing. And like, no, God can say something and it means multiple things and he means them all. So they're all true. And sometimes we fight over, um, I, I hate to use this, but I'm going to use it. There was, used to be a beer commercial and it would be, taste great, less filling. And they would fight and argue. It was played on TV that tells you how old I am. Um, but it was so funny and, and of course the obvious answer was both taste great and less filling. Um, but that's human nature, to fight over those, like, no, it's got to be this one, no, it's got to be that one. 
Um, but oftentimes, there's more in the text than what than what we realize. Um, <clears throat> but from that time, then we see that the the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. We know that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, which was 37 years and a gap after Christ was crucified. Um, and so that creates like this possibility of a gap of time between one and then 37 years later and then this final week. So it looks like the answer is that those 70 weeks would be divided into two pieces um, because of this last part, which we haven't seen the abomination of desolation. Jesus prophesied that that would, that that would happen um, and tells us that that would be a sign of the end times in Matthew 24. So this sets up the, this final week that the tribulation will be seven years. This is really the only passage that gives us the tribulation is seven years. If you go to um, the book of Revelation, how long does it say that the, that, that time is going to last? Anybody? Seven years. It doesn't. It tells individual things that like this might be for five months, that they would be tortured. But there's nothing that says how long that time is going to be. Except for this clue that uh, it, it does say that the Antichrist would reign for 42 months and the, the two witnesses will be 1260 days which is, could also be equated to 42 months. So there are times in there but they don't tell us this is the only passage that we have that suggests that it's going to be 7 years. Because it's um, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. So we but from the book of Revelation with 42 months, we really presume that the main part of the tribulation is really going to be in that second half. Um, and so when you talk about the timing of the tribulation, you know, there's one that uses a pre-trib, which means before the seven years. But we don't really have a lot more than this passage to tell us that that's when things start. Okay. And the whole passage is about six things. And that's from the very first verse. Seventy-sevens are decreed for finishing transgression, making it into sin, and making atonement for iniquity. And these things were definitely fulfilled when Christ was crucified. That was, you know, it is finished, he declared from the cross. Um, you covered all their sins, Psalm 85, 2. And behold the Lamb of God, um, who takes away the sin of the world, that's John 1, 29. So those things were, were fulfilled. But when we look at bring in everlasting righteousness, seal of vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy place, people have made the case that those were all fulfilled in the first century. But I just, you know, seal of vision and prophecy, was Israel becoming a nation again? Was that an accident? That's not a fulfillment of prophecy in our modern time? I think things like that... Um, you know, there's a lot of intellectual arguments that people will make, but then I think it's it's grounded things, it's looking at grounded things like this and going, yeah, but could we have sealed up and completed all prophecy when we obviously have modern fulfillments of prophecy? I'd say no. Like, those having modern fulfillments are what prove that prophecy is not done. Um, if we didn't have any modern fulfillments to point to, yeah, I agree. That might be a valid, you know, thing to consider. And prior to 1948, you know, you could kind of say that. So you think all the time in the church, you've got all these old 19th century theologians. You know, prophecy's not being fulfilled anymore. So that seems, you know, maybe you can make that case. But now we've we've got new information. We've got prophecy being fulfilled in front of our eyes, and we can't miss it. That that demonstrates. That, that we really are in this time where we're waiting. So we have three things fulfilled and three things not fulfilled. Hmm, that's kind of weird. Um, and <clears throat> we also, if we look back, a lot of people have tried to, to see a different way to for the 490 years to be fulfilled. But I started looking at this because I thought maybe there's a second fulfillment of that verse, but then in order to do that, there has to be a, f a first fulfillment. 
And 458 BC to 33 AD, as you cross the date line, you subtract one year. So 458 to 1 AD is 457 years. And anybody who's decent at math, 457 plus 33 is what? It's 490. Exactly 490 years. <laughs> and then the and that's the best date for the crucifixion of Christ. A lot of people have argued for 30, 31, 32, all kinds of different dates. 33 AD, though, we have extra biblical confirmation that there was an earthquake. They've gone down and they've dug down into the uh, in the Dead Sea area, and you can see it in the. Uh, a disruption in the layers that marks that's marked by an earthquake, and there's one in the time period of that you know 20 to 40 AD type time. Period. There's in, in 10 to 20 years. There's only one earthquake that happened in Judea. It's attested to by um, historic reports, and it's also demonstrated in the, in the geology that there was an earthquake. Um, and it was recorded that there was also an eclipse of the sun. Um, and you go, all right, we have good testimony that 33 AD, the 202nd Olympiad, I think it was, by their way of reckoning at that time, that there was a, that that was the year of the crucifixion. It should also be the hardest year for the early church to have lost. And this is testified by the early church. Um, again, you know, when, when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, some of the sites where all these things happened, were lost. It was a massive destruction. They burned, they flattened the place, they rebuilt it. So you can see how you lose the place. But, but certain material facts, like the day of the crucifixion, the date of the crucifixion, much harder to, to miss. Um, we also, for the start of Jesus' ministry, the best dates um, for John the Baptist and then Jesus are in the 26-27 time from 26 AD for, for John the Baptist. Um, and 27 AD for, for, for Christ. Um, and you go, well, but then that would mean that Christ's ministry was about seven years long. And I can tell you nobody says that. Um, most everybody, in fact, I, I would, who was taught that it was three and a half years? Some people maybe, and some people will make a case for, for one year or less. Um, I, I can tell you after looking into it, why do we think three and a half years? Well, we'll go, well, because we have a certain number of Passovers, but we have nothing that tells us that, that all of the things that Jesus did are accounted for in the Gospels. In fact, we have the opposite. We have the testimony that, in, in fact, if they had written down everything Jesus said and did, all the books in the world wouldn't be able to contain it, um, which is hyperbole, but it means that hey, we didn't write everything down, guys. There was a lot that happened. We just gave you some of it. And it was the parts that the Holy Spirit told us to write down. Um, Eusebius was the, um, one of the first big church historians, and he made a case for three and a half years. And that was when, really, the church started becoming um, sort of, uh, I don't know, official, because it became the, the he was the um, official sort of historian for Constantine who made Christianity legal and from there we really saw the, the growth of the of the church as you know part of uh, civil society and the organization organization of governments um, but earlier 150 years earlier than that um, you had uh, Irenaeus who was one of the early and very reliable church fathers make the case that Jesus' ministry was 10 years. Because when the people said to him, you know, uh, hey, you're not yet 50 years old, so how can, you know, you, you have known Abraham. And there was a, a scene where he's talking about, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they, they, they got really upset at that um, because they knew he was claiming to be God. And other people will say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, no, he did Many times, and the Pharisees understood it, and that's why they crucified him. Um, but for him to make the argument that, for them to say, you're not yet 50, Irenaeus says he must have been over 40. Um, the reason that's significant is because it tells you that the earliest church fathers, even within 100 years of, 
of um, for 150 years of Christ, they didn't know. So how does someone later know? Nobody knew. So these are this is one of the mysteries, and I think the the missing puzzle piece that helps say that it was seven years. One is is looking at these dates because. Um, we, we know from Luke that it was in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And that gives you two possibilities, 26 AD or 28 AD. Um, but if it was 28 AD, that was the year that Tiberius, that would have pointed to the, that Luke was counting from the time that Tiberius Caesar became the emperor on his own, because he had this two-year co-regency. So the question is, was Luke counting from the first time that he became co-regent or from when he became emperor two years later? That's the only question. Um, but if he had been counting from later, he would have most likely said Tiberius Caesar Augustus. Tiberius Caesar was the title that he had when he was co-regent. So I go, uh, I think it's pretty solid for the earlier date. So we have this really great date in scripture that's for the early date. We have a really great date for 33 AD and it fits in the timeline of Daniel that gives us 490 years to the year. So I go, uh, I'm going to put my confidence in the scripture and I'm going to call it a longer ministry even though that's against our general church tradition. But there is no scriptural reason to deny a longer ministry. So even though that's kind of a new idea, I think it's right. Um, Definitely from 33 AD again to 458, there's no question that's, that's um, 490 years. The only other way to get a count from here is to, to take a shorter um, and a later decree, 444 BC, and to shorten the year from 365 days and a quarter to 360 day years. And this is all explained in the book why Mm, I don't think we should use a special count um, of years and days um, in the text, and I don't want to get tangled up in that any longer. Um, and there's also seven weeks to, I think, the, the restoration of Jerusalem and the death of Nehemiah that gives us a way to rationalize 7 and 62. Um, but this was important to, can you really see 490 years in the first time? for what I'm about to show you next. Um, and, and why a gap? How did a gap come about in the first place? Why did we say, you know, there was 483 years to Christ and then a gap of 2,000 years and we're waiting for one final seven, which is the standard idea. Um, here's John Walbert. While the interpretations of the first 69 sevens is thus afforded a literal fulfillment, nothing can be found in history that provides a literal fulfillment of the last seven or the 70th week. And it has been taken by many that this indicated a postponement of the fulfillment of the last seven years of the prophecy to a future seven-year period preceding the second advent. If so, a if that's true, right? So he's admitting, I, I don't know, it just that's the only thing we can think of. And if that's true, then a parenthesis of time involving the whole present age is indicated. So... This is former president of Dallas Theological Seminary. A lot of times what happens is somebody makes an idea and they, they look at the name of the guy and they go, see, that's a fact because John Walford wouldn't have said that if it wasn't proven, right? Or something along those lines. But when you dig into what they wrote, oftentimes you can find, well, what, what were the reasons for that? And here's one place where he's very clear that he didn't have a very good reason for it. It's just presumed. So, what am I saying? Well, <clears throat> normally they would go 444 BC, 33 weeks, 69 weeks, counting a shorter year, and to, to make it fit into this time, and then guessing that there was a 283 or more week gap until this final week. And I accepted this because I didn't have any better idea either. And if you've been taught on Daniel, this is what everybody's been taught. This is the prevailing understanding of that. But then that means it's really 352 weeks, not 70. Uh, I don't know, but that just that bugged me. Like, yeah, God can pause the clock 
and he can say it's 352, but I'm only going to count 70 of them. But I just didn't think that's a good answer. And so, um, but then there's another possible solution. So in looking up the temple, um, I found that Jerusalem had been restored and rebuilt a second time by Sultan Suleiman, who was a who was a, 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 a sultan, a king. He would do things by firman, what they call them, decrees. And I go, well, if he rebuilt Jerusalem and spent all that money, he must have made a decree. Um, and I looked. So I came up with this idea in like 2008 as I was looking for the temple and just saw that it was restored. And I go, well, could, could that be a coincidence that it was a second restoration of Jerusalem, a possible decree? Looked everywhere, I couldn't find the decree um, until, you know, 2020 is when I found that. But um, I also found this verse in Isaiah, foreigners will build up your walls and their kings will minister to you. And so you go, well, foreigners will build your walls. That's a prophecy of non-Jews rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Wow, that's interesting because the first time when Nehemiah and Ezra rebuilt the walls, anybody know that story? They, they, the surrounding nations wanted to help them. They said, no, 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 no you're not going to have any part with us. And when they denied them the opportunity, they were threatening to attack. And they had to rebuild the walls with the sword in one hand and you know, tools in the other. So, so Jews were the only ones who did that. Um, so, so 1537, hmm, that's, that's like close to 500 years, you know, back. That just, it seemed, seemed interesting. So you already know and understand from the issuing a decree to restore the build Jerusalem until Messiah Prince. Wait, that's two times. It's assumed that Prince, Messiah is modifying Prince. Messiah is or anointed one. Or the anointed prince, sometimes people translate it. Um, and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. The problem with calling this Messiah the prince, meaning Christ, is a couple, next verse later it says, and the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Same word. So, wait, how can it be prince is the Messiah in the previous verse, but then the next verse the prince is obviously the Antichrist. Or, are there seven weeks and 62 weeks until the Messiah? And seven weeks and 62 weeks until the Antichrist? This is a double prophecy. Especially since there must have been another decree. And then it will be built again with plaza and moat, Rehob and Trutz. So Rehob, you know, sometimes you'll see streets in a trench. So this is where you really have to go to the original words. You want to know what specifically is God talking about. Is it streets or is it a trench? Is it, I mean, is it plaza or is it streets? Is it, is it a trench or a moat? Um, the reason why it says streets is it's not meaning a street. It's meaning a big open area, which sometimes was the, the gate of the city or a wide area of the street where people would, it was a place people could meet. So sometimes that was done in a town square or in the, in the gate. They would meet in the gates. So it would be a wider area at the gate for people to come in and go out or... Um, Ezra calls the plaza of the Temple Mount the Rehob of the Temple. Same word. So Rehob doesn't only mean the Temple Plaza, but it includes the Temple Plaza. And trench or moat, trench can just be a dugout ditch. But if we're talking about restoring it, that must be a structure. So it must be more like a moat than just, you know, they're going to restore a ditch. They're going to redig the ditch. No, I don't think that's what they're talking about. Um, and shockingly, there is a moat in the old city. So there's a picture of it. And, and it's got these old stones. So you go like, yeah, but how old is that moat? Um, and, uh, and, and it has, but, but it's, you can see that actually these, anybody seen the Western Wall stones? <coughs> Have, the lowest ones all have these margins on it. This is these these stones are the size and quality and and type of the Western Wall. So that's how you know this is an old 
um, in an old moat. And it has a plaque in it. The order, and so this was big. This guy made Turkish Jerusalem. He's just a, a, a guy in Turkey who wrote a book to document all of the Ottoman inscriptions in Jerusalem. He put up pictures and he put the translations. So I don't read, you know. But then it's like the order to construct this tower for the protection of the Islamic walls by the power and duration of his reign and oppose the favoring idols by his force and strength, the one that did Allah especially elected to rule the neck of the kings in the world, the possessor and chain of the throne of the caliphate, Sultan of Sultan, son of Sultan, son of Sultan, Suleiman. And then it's cut off um, because I think there's some illegible areas or damage. Um, but that's, that's a decree, but it doesn't have a date. So you go, oh. But it looks like a, a real decree. Um, and it's at a moat. And then here's a map of the Temple Mount. It's the Dome of the Rock. This is where the, the other one is. And it's the Sabil Bab al Atam, which is a, the fountain at the Gate of the Darkness. And it has another, um, another plaque here. It says, He has ordered the construction of this blessed Sabil, our master, the Sultan, the great Sultan, and honorable Hakan, who rules the next of the nations, the Sultan, of the lands of Rome. The Arabs and the Persians, the Sultan Suleiman, son of Sultan, on the date of Hijra, the prophet, at the beginning of Shaban, the blessed year 943. So here you have the whole thing. And that Gregorian date is the beginning of Shaban is the 13th to the 23rd of January, 1537. So I'm like, wait a sec. You have stone plaques. One's at a moat. One's at a plaza just like the prophecy says, and it says it's decreed to be restored, it's there today, and it has the date 1537. That's, that's amazing. All right, so what's 483 plus 1537? 2020. Did anything significant happen in 2020 that might corroborate that that is not just a coincidence? Um, so, yeah, no, I think it's, it's huge. So this is uh, a drawing my daughter made. So this is uh, Elena Widener. Um, and I asked her to make something that would, you know, show this decree setting up a second countdown. So there's this big countdown, 483 years. And then that kicks off a final um, seven years. So what, <clears throat> Dana 925, seven weeks and 62 weeks until Messiah Prince. So there's two titles. And the prince who destroys the city and the sanctuary is the next verse. So what's more likely that, that that's, you know, um, that here it means Messiah and here it means Antichrist or that maybe it is a double prophecy? Um, so... Is there 69 weeks and a long gap? Or could we be looking at literally two, a 70 weeks to the first coming of Christ and a 70 weeks to the second coming? 458 BC to 33 AD, a big gap of time, 1537 to 2027. And that's nuts. But I think that's what is there. mentioned 2020. Yeah, so let me let me keep it. Um, so when he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. So what marks the final week? A firm covenant with the many. Um, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and the wing of abomination will become one makes it desolate. So in the middle of that time frame there has to be some abomination of desolation on the Temple Mount. So if 2020 is the start of that, that would be Maybe 2024, um, probably in the spring. But he will make a firm covenant with the many. Do we have a firm covenant? Do we have a Daniel 9 peace treaty in effect? So I think we do with, with the Abraham Accords. So who, who, saw, who saw this and goes, wait a sec, that's something... I mean, this has been, like, that's neat, it's interesting, 
but why is this potentially special? Um, because it's called the Abraham Accord. So when he says he will confirm or make firm a covenant, um, that word covenant can refer, doesn't have to, but it can be a clear allusion to the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that gives them the land. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to mean that, but it, but it does mean a confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant by calling it the Abrahamic Accords with the Muslim nations. And before, whenever they did peace treaties, everybody, when they do peace treaties, they do it between nations. But all of a sudden, this Abraham Accords is for everybody. There's four nations signed on right now. There's more nations that are looking to add on to it. So you go, do we really have something that could be called the confirmation of the covenant with many nations that started in September of 2020? Yes. This meets all of the limited information that's given in the text. So it's, it's not exhaustive. It doesn't... Prove there's no way it could not. This is the part where it goes. It's faith. Do you, if you see something that matches what's in Scripture, do we go, wow, yeah, that does fit Scripture, or do we go, well, yeah, but that can't be it, right? Even though it meets Scripture, how can that be the right one? How can that be? But you know, it was like, no, this will never stand because now Biden's in office and he's going to undo all that, and he sort of tried. But guess what? It survived. And then he turned and he started embracing it. And now we're two years in. And they're talking about still adding more nations. Like this thing's just getting stronger and stronger. More and more real. So, to me, every day that goes by, every time this thing just keeps getting built up more and more, it's validating that this really is the confirmation of the covenant that's marking the final week. They've never had this you know, an agreement like this that's with many nations. This is so weird. It's, you know, Jordan makes a peace treaty with Israel. Turkey makes a peace treaty with Israel. Um, Egypt makes a peace treaty with, but not all the nations make the same treaty and affirm. Even if they have different terms, they still call it the Abraham Accords. They're, they're all wanting to put it under this umbrella. Why? Christian. Yep. It was my understanding from the text and from other Bible people Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. So, so is it the Antichrist that makes it? Repeat the question. It is. Is it the Antichrist? It says he will make firm. So, it doesn't that mean the Antichrist has to be the one? Doesn't it mean the Antichrist has to be one of these guys? He has to be the one signing it from the cameras. Does he? Or can he be behind the scenes? even up to this present time and unknown, to be revealed at the abomination of desolation. I, I think, yes, the Antichrist should be involved in it, but it says what it says, actually, in the text. He will make firm, or he will confirm the covenant. That actually doesn't mean that he has to even be the one who starts it, I don't think. He has to affirm it. He has to make it firm. He has to strengthen it. He has to build it up. Right? He has to embrace it. But, but he could be one of the, um, and like one of the interesting things, you know, who's, who was instrumental to these accords that's not up here, signing, and still hasn't signed it, is Saudi Arabia. But recently, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, is this guy right there, actually wrote, um, when Biden made his visit, he made a public statement, and he thanked Saudi Arabia for their role in getting the Abraham Accords passed. Hmm. That's one of the first, it was always known that Saudi Arabia was behind the scenes approving it because none of the other nations would have been able to sign on to it without their sort of tacit approval. Um, but it was confirmed sort of publicly that they were involved. Um, so what role might Saudi Arabia still have to play? I think they have a big role to play still. Um, but let's see, this does have to continue, right? There are things still yet that have to happen. But right now, things are happening that, at a minimum, fulfill what we're told to watch for. Yep. Do we know kind of an idea where uh, 
you know, the antenna crease is possibly toy code? Is there some scripture that would recommend? So there's Saturday there's a then? There's a bunch of clues in scripture about who the Antichrist will be. And to make it tougher, and there's a whole uh, section on, on this in the book. Um, but is the Antichrist, as we know, what we're looking for the Antichrist. Is that the beast from the sea or the beast from the earth? Is it the beast or the false prophet? Or is, it, is the term Antichrist, just like many Antichrists will come, is it really an amalgam of actually two bad actors? And, and so those, those properties that we're looking for in the Antichrist might be shared by two people. Because he's supposed to be an Assyrian. Um, you could imply that you know, he will not worship the God of his fathers could be taken to mean that actually he's got some kind of Jewish descent. Um, there's uh, you know, Gog and Magog. Uh, Turkey and some of those places. Is he going to come out of some of those regions? Yeah. So could any of the really rich people be candidates? Um, it's got to be somebody who um, who has charisma, right? Who the people love and embrace to some extent. But again, there's two. People, there's going to be this beast from the earth and a beast from the sea. Who's the one who makes everybody get the mark and worship the beast? Does anybody remember? The beast from the sea or the false prophet. It's the false prophet who makes them get the mark. So wait, I thought the Antichrist makes people get the mark. So is it the false prophet that's really who we think of the end? Are they both? Really, are the who's behind them both, right? It's it's the it's Satan. So Satan is driving both those, you know, the beast and the false prophet. But there are things that we're like set up to look for, and the more specifically we think we know who the Antichrist is, the more we might be looking over here when he's really over there, right? So this is a time where whoa, no, wait a sec, we've got to keep. Eyes wide open. I don't think it's going to be easy to identify the Antichrist until he sets himself up in the temple of God and declares himself to be God. And even that may not be as obvious as we think it's going to be. That might be something that, you know, we go, look, there it is. But, but the rest of the world may not really see it that way. It might be more subtle in the way it acts out, but we know where to look. And so... Um, you know, like it's it's like going for uh, we, we we did a, a trap shoot thing where we're walking around and you know they're the clays are flying at a different place and sometimes you know you don't know exactly how it's gonna go but you you know where to look and so you you know you're ready and then you know but if you were just looking over here you might not even see that other clay pop out because you didn't know where to look. Um, and and there's some part of this age that we're going into that's deceptive, that we need to keep an open mind. Um, it, you need to know what to look for, but we also need to recognize that we, it may not happen exactly the way what we think. And I think this is a big one. I think this is one that's happening right in front of us that just hasn't been recognized. At least should be talked about like, wow, that is confirming an Abraham, Abrahamic covenant and it's with many nations. Alright, let's watch that. Yeah. Greece is a very sea-like country. And George Soros is from the sea, but he's Jewish. Right. Yeah, so there, there are aspects of those. Oh, sorry. So he's like looking at Greece. You know, could somebody like George Soros be... Um, I mean, there's a lot of actors right now that you can definitely say are being used in Satan's plan, whether they're fully aware of it or not. Um, and I would expect that um, that there are, you know, sort of Faustian, there, there are people who have made their deals with the devil, and um, they understand exactly what they're, uh, like Howard had a comment about, you know, responding to people in, in love, right, and, and winning people over by love. 
And, and that's totally true with people who are deceived. There's another class of wolf in sheep's clothing that they know exactly what they're doing, right? And they're here to devour the sheep. And that's, that's a different response, right? That's a shepherd response um, that I think needs, you know, that's a manly response to go, uh-uh, no, nope. not here because that's, there's a difference. There's a difference between winning people um, who have been taken captive and defending against ravenous wolves who are tearing the flock. Um, and we have to use the sermon to try to figure out where that is. But some of those wealthy guys, I'm, I have a hard time believing they're just, you know, deceived and they want the best. I think a lot of them know exactly what they're doing, and it's it's demonic and evil. Um, and then the temple and the sacrifices, you know, we're still waiting. But could we really be close enough that in a couple of years you could see the restoration of sacrifice and the start of rebuilding the temple? I mean, we are. Can it, you know, there are some things that still have to happen. There's a political piece that's holding back everything else that's ready. You know, the, the gold menorah is there. This is where, in that book, the, the temple revealed, this is where I think the Holy of Holies of the temple was. I think there's going to be a temple in the next couple of years rebuilt there. I don't know how. That's a faith thing because of these other things of where I think we are in the timeline. So somehow I think it's going to happen. And I see things moving in that direction that could make it happen. Yep. Does the temple have to be rebuilt before the tribulation can start? So I don't think so, and I'll tell you the reason why I don't think the temple has to be rebuilt. Following on, if yep. you think it starts in 2020, three and a half years later, the law, the man of lawless is going to be revealed, and you're saying in the next couple of years the temple is going to be rebuilt, he has to be revealed while he's in the, the temple. Right. So how does that work? Yeah, no, no, those are those are awesome questions. Um, so, so one thing is either there has to be a temple there. The, the word it says that he will, he will go to the nous, is the Greek word, which means the Holy of Holies. And that generally refers to the building. However, it may also just refer to the space. So imagine a press conference, and he's standing right here, and he says something that equates to in the temple of God. Because... The reason I say that, this whole area, if you look, it says, and they were in the temple courts every day, worshiping God. This whole place was called, in the New Testament scripture, it was called the temple. That whole area was called that. It says he was in the portico of Solomon. They were in the temple. They were, you know, in the front gates. In that whole space, it was referred to as, as the temple. The money changers, right? Where were they? They were in these outer courts. But they're in that temple mount. That whole place is the general temple. But there's a specific spot that was the threshing floor and that was the temple. <clears throat> now, if they make a peace agreement, they can rebuild right there. They have plans already drawn up. This is all possible to still happen. Um, but but what, I, what I try to... To look at when I'm when I'm looking at the, the text and I'm trying to decide how things can happen, um, it's the text has to be literally fulfilled. But does it have to be the fulfilled the way that that I imagine it will be? And I think the answer is no. It doesn't because what does it say? It says he will set himself in the holy place. I would go. I I know where that is. It's right there. So something's going to happen. Here. Here. And that's either going to be a building, could be a tabernacle, or it might just be right there in the big open area that he's standing right there where the temple was and he, there's some big press conference. So I, I don't know how it will happen, but because I know where to watch. You then, say right there, are you regarding are you this the dome of the spirits? Okay, not the dome and, of the and no, dome of the rock, I do not think is the right place. And that is the popular. All scholars generally agree that that's the spot. Um, they're, you know, secular and semi-secular, um, as well as even some, some Christians view that as the right spot, and most of the rabbis do. Not all the rabbis, some of them. And I've had Jewish people interact with me, and they also know that that's a special place, but it has to win the debate more broadly. But first they have to have permission, and if they get permission, they will make a bona fide, you know, dig. 
The reason why it's a mystery is nobody's been allowed to dig. What, what I've made a case for in the book is that there are two landmarks that are visible, this threshing floor, this flat rock, bedrock stone. It's about 10 feet in diameter. It's this big, giant, flat piece of bedrock. It's, it's, you know, it's not giant, but it's, it's pretty big. Um, and you go, how did that get there? How did that whole platform get leveled to one piece of bedrock right there? And only one way, only one way did you get this whole giant platform level to that bedrock. If you were building that as a platform floor and you found a big flat area of bedrock and you go, oh, I'm gonna build a big platform here, this is my datum reference. And I'm gonna set all my lines and I intentionally build the entire floor level to this piece of bedrock. Because I can't move the bedrock. So they had to have used that bedrock as a reference to build the entire platform. Which of course means the bedrock was there before the platform. So it's not like a cornerstone? Um, so this, I think in here, it was used as a cornerstone for the Temple of Jupiter that Hadrian made. The first person to build on this Temple Mount any serious structure besides the, the, the buildings and huts and structures that the Roman 10th Legion built was um, Hadrian. And he would have had to clear an area and build a platform for that temple. And that temple was then later destroyed, um, probably by Emperor Constantine. Um, but, but we know historically that it was built. Um, and then, and it has, that rock in there has this 90 degree cutout. And it's spaced like for, as if a cornerstone for a building. And in those days, in ancient times, when you build a big building out of stone, you always set it on either a giant cornerstone or bedrock as your, as your reference point so that you can build the rest of it out and have an immovable reference. So it makes, and then a, a building that was used that as a cornerstone would have centered perfectly in the, in the overall platform and makes a lot of sense. And I sort of explain that in the book too. Um, they've also practiced sacrifices. They've got a red heifer, so there's only two ways for them to start sacrifice. There's only one sacrifice the Jews can do in an unclean state. Does anybody know what that is? It's a Passover sacrifice. The Passover sacrifice in the Torah, they're told even if they're unclean, that they can make that sacrifice. Um, that was one, and so that gives them one sacrifice they can definitely start. The, the only other sacrifices that they can do are if they have their ashes, the red heifer, and they've been purified. So there's, there's two, two big events. They're either going to do the red heifer sacrifice or they're going to do a Passover sacrifice. This past year, anybody know there was a, a reward of 10,000 shekels if they could successfully uh, sacrifice a lamb on the Temple Mount? And there were some people who were arrested trying to do it. Um, so it, it didn't happen. But they've been doing practice Passover sacrifices for the last more than 10 years. So they're, they're ready. They can start. Um, and when they rebuilt the temple the first time, they started the sacrifice and then rebuilt the temple. So these, these things can happen. They just were waiting for that, you know, okay, yep, it just happened. Um, and those are, those, are, those are things that need to be in place and they need to be watched for. So, <clears throat> but because of these other things that have happened, I'm pretty confident that we'll see them. And, it, and if these do happen, you'll know, right? That, so the, the whole thing about this book is this setting up a scenario and saying that we're looking, we've been told to watch for things and it's still a ways off, but everything we can see right now looks like what, what we're expecting. And as that continues to get closer, I think it's going to continue to look more and more and fulfill more and more of these things. We're going to see that if it starts to show that it's different, right? Well, then we'll know, oops, yep, it looked like it, but now we see that it's not. Getting that red heifer, that was done down in Texas, wasn't it? So there's, right there's candidates for red heifers in Israel and in the, US, the United States. Um, there is none that I know of yet that they've said, yet, yea, verily, this is, this is it. They're, they're holding, um, that might still be yet this year, or it might be <coughs> next year, or it might be 
you know, a long time from now. But <clears throat> I suspect that that's going to pop out soon too. Right? These are these are things that we can only, <clears throat> you know, sort of guess at what's going to happen. But when we know what to watch for, then it will just it'll start making more and more sense as these happen, or it'll become more and more definitive. Like, how do you know it's gonna, we're not going to be deceived, was your question? If it stops following the, the pattern that Scripture lays out. But as long as it keeps following the scripture, Scriptural pattern, then I think it's a lot safer to recognize it than it is to go, ah, no, I'm not, not time to get ready yet because all the things haven't happened yet. I think uh, they're, they are happening, so let's keep watching, but, but you know, know what to watch for. So I don't know that they need the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant would move the people. So a lot of people have thought maybe they're going to find the Ark and that will create the emotional spirit that will inspire the people to, to do something. But they didn't have the Ark in the Second Temple. So, I mean, clearly they don't have to have it for them to restart all these things. Um, and this, this location is, is open, so... Um, so have you have you met any of the uh, the Jewish rabbis and so forth that that are part of that incident? The Temple Institute. I've contacted them. Um, tough, right? For a Christian to, you know, an engineer that's gonna try to tell them something new about the temple. I gotta tell you, it's like, you know, it's almost like an insult for me to even try to suggest that. I have new information they haven't considered. Um, but I still have sent it to people, and I've got some good response, but not from the key leaders. What I was kind of hoping is that it would filter in with a few people, and that they would then present, you know, and then it would sort of catch on. But that, that has to be a move of the Holy Spirit, right? God has to, and I'm just trusting that. That if, if you know, if God wanted me to have any part of that, that he would be the one who moved the mountain, and I just have to provide the loaves and fish. And this institute, those people are convinced that that's uh, that you're talking about, the, not, the city, not the city of David? But the, no, the city of David is only a Christian thing. Um, no serious... Um, has anybody heard the city of David and felt that was a compelling... Um, is, that, is that a new idea to anybody, that it was the city of David, where the ark and the temple were located? Joel Rosenberg, it was Bob Cornuke. Um, Joel Richardson, I, he doesn't take a stance okay. on the temple. Um, although I've talked to him about it, and I think he um, would would say, yeah, no, I think he, I think he would support me on on what I'm saying. Um, but he definitely wouldn't go for the city of David. Scripture itself rules out the city of David because it says they brought the the that the uh, tabernacle was in the city of David, and they brought up the ark out of the city of David, and where did they put it? In the temple, <coughs> up on Mount Moriah. Um, and there's there's a bunch of reasons why it could have been. David already owned all the city of David because he conquered it. So he bought the um, threshing floor of Arona, and there's two prices that he paid. Uh, I think it's uh, 50 shekels of, of silver and 600 shekels of gold. And at a 10 to 1, um, valuation of gold to silver that's more or less kind of a decent historical guide um, it's orders of magnitude more land so he bought a huge area for 600 shekels of gold um, and he bought it outside of the city of David and where? Mount Moriah that was up above and that's where it says also the threshing floor was um, you don't thresh inside the city you thresh outside where you've got your fields and also where you have a place to carry away the, the chaff. So um, the Temple Mount is definitely right. People have tried to argue that it was the uh, the Romans built the Temple Mount and because it's the right sort of area size for a legion to camp. And the 10th Legion did camp there, but not until after its destruction. Um, and in the, in the construction of the Temple Mount itself, um, the volume that was it was encapsulated to build that whole area up because it, it was a, a mountainside and they had to build a retaining walls and, and level all that area. 
the volume they added, um, I estimate, is actually larger than the Great Pyramid of Giza. So the Temple Mount is a huge mass. I mean, there's, there's stones in there 40 feet long, um, 10 feet tall, and 6 to 8 feet deep. It's, a, it's an amazing, massive engineering work. Some Roman soldiers who were bored or, you know, in between battles built something like that is just impossible. Um, so, but th this is the book that I wrote. This actually is standing in front of the Dome of Spirits, and it's looking towards the Golden Gate. That's the Golden Gate right here. The um, Golden Gate was in a direct line with the temple. And so, I make the case that you have this landmark from the temple, the Golden Gates, in that wall. Um, and you have this flat piece of bedrock. They're perfectly in line. And someone would go, oh, there's a straight line. There's always a straight line between two points. But it's a straight line that's also parallel to the, the northern line and perpendicular to the gate. So that's not an accident. Um, the probability that it happened by accident is like 0.07%. So there's a 99.93% chance that that alignment is on purpose. And with two landmarks, you actually have a position and an orientation. So you have a fixed location with, with landmarks that have a move. So to me, it makes the temple location super simple. Isn't that a cross, though? You have a cross, you get perpendicular? Um, well, if you had another line that you drove through right there, or if you, if you called it a cross through that, through that wall. Oh, you know, just yeah. For us that are maybe yeah. So people will debate that, and it's there's it's tradition that links the threshing floor of Aruna with anything in the past. We know that that was on Mount Moriah, and Abraham went to the mountains of Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. So it's it's a presumption that where Isaac was sacrificed was actually in the same place. So that, that, that God has always been calling, you know, people back to this place. And it's the, um, when, when, when they first came into the promised land, Moses, you know, uh, as he's writing that, you know, you're going to go and you're going to do sacrifices. He says, but when you get to the place that I will show you, you are to offer sacrifices nowhere else. And that's what made uh, the, this Temple Mount special. Like after that was, but, but the Jews carried the tabernacle around still for almost 500 years before the temple was built. So for 500 years, they worshipped and they sacrificed all over the place, wherever the, the thing is moving, and they didn't get to that place that I will show you. But when they built the temple, um, and they're dedicating it, then God says, you know, this is the place that I told you, right? This is the place that I've chosen. Uh, and referring back to the place that he had told him he would choose. And so from that time on, this became the, the special place. Well, was that the first time that God took him there? doesn't seem like it. It seems like that's also where he took Abraham a thousand years before that. Because Abraham's 2000 B.C. The temple's 1000 B.C., roughly. It's like 930-something, um, I think. Um, but, but anyway... It's still, it's a roughly, and Abraham's also 19, 1800. But it's roughly a thousand years difference. So a thousand years before that, I'm sure there was no evidence of Abraham's altar, right, still left on the place that was now the threshing floor. But is it likely that God took them back to the same place? I think so. Um, there's also some, some thoughts about where did um, Jacob have his dream and he laid his head on a rock, and he saw, um, and they called it Bethel, um, and, you know, this is where, um, you know, surely this is the house of God. There's some confusion because there's a place called Bethel um, that is in a different area. <clears throat> it's not, it's not right there. So was that the same? Is it different? I'm not really, I'm not really sure that the Jews would say definitely that that was the foundation stone where he laid and that it is the same place. <clears throat> but but again, we don't have 
We don't have concrete things that we can really tie that to. But those are the ideas <coughs> that, that God has always called that a special place and that it wasn't new. He didn't just invent that in a thousand, you know, 930. Um, actually, it was, would have been to David who first, you know, had that revelation, so a little bit even earlier. But in David's time, you know, this was, whatever was up here was a big field and, and the place where the temple was built had to have been bedrock. So <clears throat> another reason that this is a good spot is because the reason why there's a big, long retaining wall is because after, really, the Dome of the Rock and a little bit further, it starts dropping off. So the only place they could have had <clears throat> a, uh, a temple is really in that northern part. northern and, and middle parts. Um, and so <clears throat> I, I wrote this because I, I did feel like God was leading to me. Amazing thing that I had Josh McDowell as a forward. I got to meet him and you know that that kind of helped open some doors um, to get that first book out. <clears throat> and you can see here it doesn't look you lose perspective a little bit but this is a big flat area. People tried to argue that this was a, a flagstone right? like a normal um, the normal part that they just suddenly decided, let's bring in a giant 25 ton um, flagstone and we'll just, you know, put it there in the top corner because we ran out of smaller stones. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys are the same, but to me, that like those kind of arguments, I just go, um, no way anybody did that. Nobody built a floor of all normal sized flagstones, but decides just one giant 25 ton stone we're going to carry and put it over here and nowhere place and perfectly aligned with the golden gate like no that didn't it's it's bedrock and uh the early explorers who came on here uh, charles warren they did rock surveys and in their book they clearly say no nope, this is bedrock um the israeli antiquities authority also recognizes this is bedrock so that that's what makes it a landmark you know that's bedrock that's something you can count on that has always been there on that mountain this is bedrock. That goes back all the way to, you know, anybody's first visit. That was there. Sure, it could have been covered over by dirt. Could have been something else, but it was there. So that that hasn't moved. It's, um, and in the the uh, actually the Golden Gate would be right right back this way. Um, it has two. There's a lot of things that show that it's a real gate, but one of the things is there's two. Um, gatepost stones inside the gate. You can't see them from the outside, you can only see them from the inside. Only Muslims can go in right now on the inside. But there's an archaeologist who got to go in and other people in the past that have gotten to go in. And each of those gatepost stones are the size of the stones at Stonehenge. So again, you go, uh, wait a sec. You don't have 25 ton, 30 ton stones that someone just you know threw in and threw together. No, they're part of, they're perfectly in line with the, with the old stones of the wall, and they're set at the proper um, elevations for, um, for the rows of the stones. <clears throat> so the wall builds up to it. You don't just build those. Like, you can't just cut those in and drop in, you know, 25 ton stone. That's part of this part of the original wall. Um, so that's, that's part of how we know And then there's one other, how did I get stuck on this gate? Like, no, why don't I believe the archaeologists who all said it was a new gate? No, that's not from the temple, that's, that's new. That was built, you know, much later. Some people say like the 600s. This verse in Ezekiel 44. Then the man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened and no one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. And who was the God of Israel that entered through that? Jesus Christ, Palm Sunday. We celebrate his Palm Sunday. That's the gate that led into the temple that would have been facing Mount of Olives, that he would have come in from Bethany and riding a donkey into that gate. There's another gate 
to north of here that was probably an entrance um, in the ancient past also. Um, but that would have been a common gate. People probably rode animals into that gate all the time. But I guarantee you they didn't ride animals into that gate all the time. So, you know, for Christ to come in, um, riding on the donkey, entering that gate that people knew was the Messiah gate, that's special. And later it says, I saw the glory of the Lord in Ezekiel enter in through this gate. And that's why the Jews had this Messianic association. And they still do. So Jews, Muslims, and Christians still recognize that gate as a messianic gate. That God's going to go through that gate. In fact, that's why it was walled up. For the tradition that that was going to be the Messiah. So they blocked it. And yet, what did Ezekiel write 2,500 years ago? That it would be shut. And after the Lord God had entered into it, it would remain shut. And this gate right here has been sealed basically since the first century. All this time. It was never destroyed in Jerusalem. The city was this, so this gate was never... No, and in fact, people have... Josephus actually says all the gates were burned. I mean, were destroyed except for two gates. The east gate and the south gate. And then it says, and later they burned it. So we go, oh, see, it was destroyed too. But then why did he say that all of them were destroyed except two? And what would happen if you burned that? I mean, yeah, you're going to burn it, but it's, no, it wasn't destroyed. That doesn't mean it didn't get repaired. This is all Ottoman stuff, so it was built up. Um, there were things that were done to it, but it's still the same gate. Those, those gate post stones I told you about, they didn't just, move those, nothing happened to those. And as you look on these lower levels, and you can go down inside, there's a lot of originally placed stone you can see nothing has happened to. And it, it looks like the same stone that, that are in much older structures, and there's evidence of, of age. So there was so so the damage would have happened, you know, to these upper structures, um, you know, some stuff in here, uh, but but the gate itself, no, that's the same, it's the same gate. Um, and the, again, the fact that it's shut, I look at that and I just go, I mean, that gate right there has been shut for as far back in history as you can look, that we have reports. Like 400, uh, 394 BC, or, I mean BC, AD. Um, some of the first ones, that, 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 there's a lot of historical mentions of this gate by pilgrims all through history. Which is another proof that it's not rebuilt. How are pilgrims mentioning this gate, and you're seeing it mentioned all through through the historic past? No, it's, that's the original gate. <clears throat> but but for me, the prophetic testimony just it's the eastern gate of the sanctuary. It's shut. It would remain shut. That's the gate. That's not an accident. That's a faith piece. I just believe that because I believe the testimony of Scripture. And there's enough historic evidence to point me to that one, and then to me that seals the deal. That's not convincing for everybody. It's convincing for me. Especially when you add on the other things. So, so those pieces started, as I was finding all these things, they just started increasing my confidence in Scripture. And I think they'll increase your confidence in Scripture too. The more you see specific verses and you time to a historic fact, and you go, okay, yeah, that's got to be a fulfillment. So here's the alignment issue. So this is a this is a rectangle. So these are parallel um, sides, and that's perpendicular. So it's perfectly lined up. That's incredibly unlikely to have happened by accident. But if this is bedrock, so I know that didn't move. That means the position of this gate was purposely placed. And you think that they just perfect, you know, by accident lined it up right there. I don't think so. I think, yeah, that's that's something. The other thing about interesting is that we know the temple was a 500 cubit square. And this is basically 250 cubits, that northern boundary. So that gives you a 500 cubit square that would have been the ancient space of the temple. So, um, Positive. That's 
that's the right spot. And not everybody else is, but, but that's but the evidence for that is the first one. Who built up the rest of the flatness around that? Um, so, so here's bedrocks. I don't know, actually, there's bedrock, I think, right? No, it must be somewhere right in here. Now, I'd have to walk it. And I haven't been up there that many times. But right around here is a bedrock, that's bedrock, and that's bedrock. So this is all the, and then it, it falls away. Um, I forget what the contour maps are, but this starts falling away. So, so this wall was built up and filled in a little bit. Not a lot, but, but that gate walks in and there's steps that come up to this level. So it's the, the height of the gate. From here, this would have been an entrance, and then you, you go in, there's a room that goes back here, and then there's steps that go up. And all those steps also match sort of the descriptions of the, the temple. They describe how many steps they had actually climbed as you come in those gates and go up in the, in the Talmud and, and the Mishnah. So there's some records that also corroborate that design. And the gate had to be low so that they could see over it. And so it says, and when you go, that gate, um, the, the top of it, That's what I want to do. So here you're standing on that platform. That's the very top right there. It's hidden, hidden behind the letters. There's a little structure right there. That's the top of the gate. So here on this level, the temple would have been up um, a little bit from, I mean, you have the floor, but uh, I guess that's about the level. So you can see that this is the um, Mount of Olives. Right there, they believe that they would sacrifice the, the red heifer and they would be able to see into the temple and they, they, they had like an eye communication thing as part of the, the ceremony that they could see and signal each other. Um, and so from here, you can, the gate's not tall, so you can see, you can see over it and you can see the mountain, which also matches sort of the historic descriptions of what happened. So it's in the right place, but this is a really steep hill. And so once upon a time, there would have been some walkway or something to get up that gate. That's been since destroyed, um, but there's evidence that it was, that it was down there. And then there's a 99.93% chance against that alignment. Because not only does it have to be aligned, but it also has to be at the correct distance away from that gate in order for that to be the Holy of Holies, and then the temple, in the inner court and the outer court, right? You have a certain space that the whole temple took up in front of it. So, if that was in line, but right up here, it would never work. And if it was too far back, it would never work. It has to be like right in this little area right here, and lo and behold, there it is. Where does the western wailing wall? Go? So the western wall is right about here. So this. I don't have all that rectangle that's showing, but that would have been, and they're standing around the the, uh, the course right over there. So, and then there's a little place, there's called a little wailing wall. If you walk into the city and you walk through some roads, you come out to a little piece of the wall, and that's closer to somewhere in here. So, this is then, then you have more testimony in scripture. When they place their threshold next to my threshold and their doorpost next to my doorpost with only the wall between me and them, they defiled my holy name. And according to Ezekiel 43. And I look at that and I go, that looks like their doorpost next to my doorpost and their threshold next to my threshold with only a wall between me and them. And leave the outer court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations. And this then would have been the outer courts. And you have the Dome of the Rock and you have the Aqsa Mosque. And so even today, if they were able to create a Jewish zone, it would be this, and all that would be Muslim, I think. I think that at some point that's likely to happen. We still have to watch and see. Right? Those are guesses based on the scriptures and based on you know the political realities that are going on, but but I think that's what they suggest. 
So you're looking at a recreation of Solomon's Temple, but not the second one? Um, Under the time of Ezra and well, Nehemiah. So I don't, I don't know that that matters so much is, is that it's the right spot. So, the, in fact, the house, the, what they're talking about building right now is a house of prayer. So these temples, no Gentile was allowed in. But actually, they're talking about building a house of prayer for all nations, a temple that, that would be more like a church that, that people can, both Jews and non-Jews, can go into. That's also, if they do that, that'll be a fulfillment from my house we call a, a house of prayer for all nations. They cite that verse, and so they're actually thinking that, you know, we're going to do in the, in, the, in the future that the temple worship would be different. They're anticipating a, a modified temple worship, not a return to the old sacrifices. Because, well, one, they've got 2,000 years of not doing it, and because they're they're sort of operating under, you know, what, what are one of the big mistakes is, you know, that we have modern revelation, right? That, that God is working through, you know, new prophets that are giving new revelation that, that changes old revelation. And that's, you know, the Mormon church, um, you know, their doctrine of covenants and their prophets, but it's also things like um, the Jews with their rabbis, you know, giving new inspiration, and they're looking for the Messiah to give new inspiration. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, is there an attempt right now in, I think it's Bahrain, or else it's UAE, of that exact yes. ecumenical uh, type of... Absolutely. There's an ecumenical where they want to put a mosque, a synagogue, and a church right next to each other. And is that a model for what they're going to do later right here. So how does God share his glory then? He said, I won't share my glory with any and we have three. Right. So I, I think that this is the answer for that. And, and also remembering these are temporary things. Right? So that ultimately, of course, God will not tolerate any of that. But, but is there a time that has been designated you know, to leave out the outer court because it has given, been given to the nations? I think so. I mean, right now it's been given to the nations. So honestly, it's already true. Because this has been, if, if, if this is correct, that this is the right spot, this has already been given to the nations. And there's another verse here, I don't think I have it in here, but do you know that it says, but among, in the same uh, 43 or 44 uh, of Ezekiel, but among your other things, you know, you did not take charge of my holy things, but you put foreigners in charge of my sanctuary. Like, what? Wait, God accused the Jews of putting foreigners in charge of his sanctuary? And who runs the Temple Mount today? The Muslim Islamic Waqf of Jordan. Fulfilled in our times. 1967, 10 days after they recovered the Temple, Moshe Dayan made the sort of unilateral ruling that he was going to, that we're going to give the Temple Mount back to the Jordanians who had just invaded and tried to wipe them out. Unthinkable. But it's exactly what Scripture said. Someone might even want to look that up if they find it. They can read it. It's among, I think it's, maybe it's 44, but among other things, you have put others in charge of my sanctuary. Amazing. Like, it gives me chills to see things that are written in Scripture 2,500 years ago and to think about 2,500 year old prophecies happened in our days. I wasn't born yet. I was born in 73, so 67 is just a little before me. But I consider that my days. If it's, you know, if it's this present generation, that's amazing. 44, verse 7. Verse 7. You want to read it? Uh, did anybody got the mic? You have brought uncircumcised foreigners into my sanctuary, people who have no heart for God. In this way you defiled my temple, uh, even as you offered me my food, the fat, and blood sacrifices, in addition to all your other detestable sins, you have broken my covenant. Uh, that's, there must be another little 
You put foreigners in charge of my sanctuary, something like that. It's right around there. And and those are those are the lists of, of other things that you know, people uncircumcised and lips. That's what's happening. Yeah, absolutely right now. Anybody is allowed up there. Um, people are the, that place where the temple there's cigarette butts, you know, there's trash that gets thrown down, the place isn't really taken care of. Um, anybody else see what I was What's that? Twenty four eight. Twenty forty four eight. There's the next verse. Yeah. Is that what is that what you read? I read no. seven, but eight is similar. Yeah, what does it say in eight? Verse eight, instead of safeguarding my sacred sacred uh, rituals, you have hired foreigners to take charge of my sanctuary. There you go. Like what? Why would the why would the Jews let the Muslims take care of the sanctuary, that the holiest place, the only place they know that God said, this is the place for the soles of my feet and for my throne. This is the place where I'm going to do my house. They know it's special. You gave it over to them. And, and they often are digging, they're destroying evidence all the time. There's a famous, anybody heard of the Temple Mount Sifting Project? Um... There was, they did major excavations on the Temple Mount, totally illegal, dumped truckloads of dirt, and they just threw it out. And then some people went and said, hey, wait a sec, we know where that came from, let's go sift the dirt. And they're finding all kinds of archaeological evidence showing that this was indeed the, the Temple area, and things from, from that time, but they've lost now the problems that they would have had if they had excavated it and had levels and you know they knew exactly, um, but still it, it shows that that is indeed the, the right place. Um, okay, so the other thing that would have to happen though is what about the seals? And because um, you have a couple, but is there anything that would say that we, we could still be um, still in that time? So then I saw the lamb broke one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud, with a voice of thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Um, so when we look at COVID, the other name for, Kona is, for COVID is coronavirus. And corona means crown. Weird. Um, the coronavirus... Uh, it was an airborne virus that traveled around the globe. And a bow represents an airborne threat that travels long distance. Okay, also weird. Um, he goes out conquering and to conquer, but the next horse takes peace from the earth. So this conquering and conquering has to be by deception and political means and, you know, other non-violent. And through this COVID pandemic, through that excuse, we saw a global application of the COVID response by every nation on earth. Didn't matter if you were North Korea, Iran, Saudi Arabia, um, you know, Papua New Guinea, the United States, everybody responded the same. Weird. How did this, and I guarantee everybody in here when 2020 came and this thing shut down, you all felt it. Like, what the heck? Something just shifted. It was like, the earth, like anybody been in an earthquake? Maybe not too many people because we're far from earthquake zones. But the ground moves under your feet. You know something like, whoa. It's weird. It was like an earthquake. It was something that told us everybody felt it. I had unbelieving friends would never talk about anything about the Bible. All of a sudden, no, no, they they might listen. They might think about it. It changed the world, but we're starting to get used to that. Everything, we can get used to everything. Doesn't matter what it is, we can recalibrate, and then it starts to feel, and even though the water is moving gradually towards boiling, we still, you know, oh, well, I guess it's not too bad. And we can get used to it. But 
But this, this kind of fits. Doesn't prove it, right? But it's not at odds with it. And then what's the next one? Red horse. Another horse, a red horse. Another and a red horse. Went out and to him who sat on it, it was given, granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. So, have we seen anything that now is looking like an increase in violence, the possibility of World War III, um, <clears throat> increased murder rates, increased violence, um, protests at every level? And are we looking for it to potentially still continue to get worse? I don't think so. Is it global? Or is it just here? No, it's global. Almost every nation in the world is, is encountering this kind of increase of... Because it happened in the whole world, right? The pandemic happened in the whole world. All the stressors that we're feeling, the things, the messages that we're hearing, are being transmitted globally. So there's good reason... Um, to, to see global protests in 110 countries, um, 26 major conflicts, and as you heard from Howard, no, Howard called it, you know, World War III. We're not there. Some people think we're already there. When Poland was invaded by Germany, it was wasn't eight till eight months later that the that the war expanded beyond Poland. For eight months, it looked like it was just Germany and Poland. So we could also have a time period before it expands beyond Ukraine. And maybe it won't. But from right now, it's still a real, genuine possibility that Putin's not going to stop. He's going to continue. And, and that was, like, again, Howard's assessment, although I, I doubt he would see this as the red horse. right? But he's just objectively looking at what's going on and going, yeah, those are real threats. That could actually happen. And if none of this comes to, you know, again, I'll have to go, well, yeah, it looked like it at first, but then it didn't materialize. But I, I think that's where it's heading. What, what's the next horse? The black horse. And I looked, and behold, the black horse, and he sat on had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quarter of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Food will cost <coughs> close to what? Food or even just living will cost about what an average worker made in a day. That's inflation. It also implies scarcity and famine. And it implies that the rich will not be touched. There'll still be, you know, oil in the wine. You're not damaging the oil in the wine because there's still people to buy it. We live in one of the richest countries in the world. I think, you know, we're going to be, we're not going to be suffering at this level. I don't think that's the, the place where we are. Um, but imagine in these places, if it's bad for us, it's deadly. Um, and a lot of people are, are recognizing that the, the, what do you say, half the food program, food comes from Ukraine. If that doesn't go out, it's catastrophic for a lot of people. This empty shelves thing, that's real. But when does that happen before? I mean, in one place, because, you know, Hurricane Katrina is coming or something, yeah, maybe you sell out of it. But, but this is becoming more and more a phenomenon that's everywhere. And inflation is global. It's not just an American thing. It's not just a, you know, a Chinese thing. Everybody's feeling this. Again, this meets the starting criteria. It's not fully developed, I think, as well as bad as it's going to get. Christian. Yep. So it's kind of crazy seeing it, especially with like baby formula, where it yep. felt more real. We didn't have to deal with that, but just friends overall. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's unprecedented. See, it was like, hey, if you're in this area, see this right. baby formula, please get some for us. Yep. And, and if this continues, right, it's just going to become more and more true. Now then, what's the pale horse? Um, so, and they were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by the combined plagues of war, famine, pestilence, and the wild beasts of the earth. And um, that means all four horses work together. It's they, not he. 
So this is one thing that has four different aspects to it. And it ultimately yields a death rate of a quarter of the earth. Right now, today's numbers that would be two billion people. We're nowhere near that. But is that where we're heading? This, I mean, this is creepy. 2020, literally the what they could predict for deaths, we have eight billion people. So like, if you know anything about statistics, the smaller the pool that you try to use to predict the trend, the, the, the more variable your prediction might be, the more off it can be. But the bigger the sample size you have, the more predictable the outcome becomes. And when you have eight billion people, it starts to become pretty predictable to predict how many people are gonna die from any number of different causes. 2020, that number started jumping. Many more people started dying than what was predicted. And the cumulative is between 22 and 25 million people extra have died in the last two years. That's 19, 17 to 19 million more people than you can explain by COVID alone. Vaccine, you know, other kinds of just heart attack, there's depression and suicide, there's increase in violence, people being murdered. Um, but all kinds of just all cause mortality is up 20, 25 million people. What? Again, doesn't prove, and that's a long shy way from <coughs> two billion. But is that already telling us where we're going? Does it confirm at this stage the possibility that we could be there? I think it does. I think that's a that's a wild number. I mean, actuaries that, that predict um, life insurance, they were seeing an increase of 40% more than what they predicted. 40, 50% more deaths than they thought. They're never wrong. Like those tables are really reliable. They're off by a few percentages, but those guys nail it every year and they make tons of money and that's why insurance is such a great business. Except all of a sudden, oops, a lot harder to predict suddenly, why? Well, if it's tied to the times we're in, then it's pretty easy to say why. If it's wrong, then that's where we get another really weird coincidence. And if that trend continues, but these are things that we can watch in concrete, and if they keep falling, then we have an explanation. <laughs> if it stops falling, you know, then you know. In, in science, a lot of times people try to predict things with a model. And so they create a model and they say, okay, it should follow this, and then you get real data points and you start plotting them, and you see if those real data points match the model or not. If they do, it's a good model. If they don't, then you go, not that model's you know, not the right model for what's actually happening. It doesn't explain the data. And right now we have a biblical model that lays out the path, and we have a lot of data points that are starting to happen, and I see those data points falling on the end times model that we can get. So that's why, like, okay, sound an alarm. And, and in the, the book, I make this case about a watchman. A watchman is not a watchman if he calls out a warning when the enemy is at the gates and everybody can see him. Hmm. Right? Everybody can prove it. And I haven't done you any service because I've called out what you already knew. But if I can say something a little ahead of time, there's a possibility that I could be wrong and then I'll be the one who looks dumb. But if I say nothing, then I think that's a lot worse. Because there's a responsibility, there's things that I've, I'm, I feel sure that that's exactly what it is. And so I felt compelled, and I felt like the Lord was leading me, that I have to write it. So that's my step of faith. And, and walking with what I think the Lord's telling me to, to do. Um, and so that's why, that's why all this stuff is here. I got so, a question. Yeah, <clears throat> and this is question time, so. <clears throat> uh, with, the, with all that, I think that's sure. great that God's led you to um, tell us about this. But my question is like, if it says in the Bible that no one will know the day or the time, why would God give somebody the ability to tell someone? Yeah. So, does this mean that I know when Jesus is coming on the class? I know. This sets a season. This sets a window. Yeah. Right? But it does not... When's our rescue coming? 
when we'll talk about that in the next session. I, I think there are some some good guidelines for when we shouldn't expect, like some things that need to happen. There's, there's something called the doctrine of imminency, which is an idea in the from a pre-tribulation rapture viewpoint that would say um, there's no way to know the, the the day or time, and because we can't know when the day or time is. It has to come at a time when there's no possibility of, of, I mean, there's nothing that has to happen first, right? So that it's always been imminent. And my answer to that is we were told that we need to live as though it's imminent. It never says that there's nothing that has to happen, right? So that's an inference from Scripture. So the, the, the logical statement is because we're told to live as though Jesus could come back at any moment. There can't be anything that has to happen first because otherwise we wouldn't be able to live as though Jesus had to come back first because we'd be watching for something first. right? But I think that's a false logical statement. Um, that would be like saying that you can't train for war when you know it's not really war. Or you can't train for something, you know, do a, a fire drill because there's no real fire. Like, yeah, of course we can so, and any one of us, um, Howard mentioned this last night, can go to meet Jesus at any time. There was a woman, there was a comedian giving a talk. Um, she was like bragging about she had the, the vax and double vax and boosted. Let's face it, Jesus loves me the best. And then boom, she collapsed. Anybody seen that video? I mean, it's like, whoa, God doesn't always, you know, but the timing... I mean, it was, it, was, it was pretty crazy. If nothing else, it demonstrates that in mid-sentence, like, where, where did sudden adult death syndrome come from? Right? Like, what? I mean, yes, we kind of knew about that for kids, but sudden adult death syndrome? I mean, that's... When did that get invented? Oh, uh, since COVID, since yeah. 2020, since 2021, probably. Since we rolled out a big, massive vaccine program that was largely untested. And start messing with people's DNA. Yeah, it's a it's a bad. I have no, you know, for whether somebody got vaxxed or didn't get vaxxed, you know, you've got to follow your conscience and you have to trust God. But but I've come to conclude that it is a massive you know, fraud that's been perpetrated. The data is bad. Um, they've messed with the data. It's not very safe. It's it's already bears shows it is the most unsafe vaccine by orders of magnitude that's ever been foisted on people. Um, and so I, I don't think it's a good or effective vaccine. But, you know. Follow the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, follow the money. But we, we've got to, you know, everybody's got to do what they can. And if you, if, you know, I've got friends who took it, and they just have to trust God for, and they're fine. And so lots of people have taken it and are fine, and that's great. <coughs> So we'll, we'll trust we'll trust the Lord for all the things that you know are kind of out of our control. So maybe we could continue to work without getting it, right? So there were all kinds of things that forced people um, into tough spots, and I think that's another place love, grace. Um, so I, I don't have I, I won't take it. My family hasn't taken it, but you know many good friends that, that do. No, so, just say no. But but yeah, I would recommend not. Um, because it's it is the science is bad for it. and there's plenty of doctors even the guy who came up with it saying oh, this isn't what it's for yeah. we're actually going to right now we're going to stop we'll do more questions later this afternoon